anxiety and accommodations, taking the NCE with confidence and qualifying for accommodations. These are kind of two separate things, but they're definitely related because if you have any sort of anxiety disorders or you just deal with just the uncertainty and the panic that sets in sometimes, that can definitely be overwhelming. And the research that I've read indicates that you can actually impact your score with your anxiety. And so by having some techniques to address that, you can actually improve without even uh, knowing more content. You can just improve your score by, by dealing with your anxiety. So we're going to kind of take this in two different sections. Our first section is just going to be testing anxiety, simply because I know not everybody's going to need an accommodation. And that way, if they need to leave, you can uh, do that after we finish this section on testing anxiety. So I want to present to you guys a test taking plan that you can feel confident in. And the reason for that is that anxiety is your future telling you that it's out of your control. That's what anxiety is. We start to future trip about things uh, that are outside of our control, wondering what's going to happen. But we're not living in the future. We're living in the present. And so you need to let the future know that you've got a plan. That's one of the best ways of uh, addressing your anxiety is feeling like there's things that you have say over, that you are not so uncertain about the future. And so what I want to present to you today is the three pass plan that I uh, encourage my customers and examinees to, to follow when they're actually sitting down to take the test. And what I also encourage you to do if you're not already taking practice exams is to find a site that offers practice exams, which we do, and there's others as well, and actually use this while you're taking the practice exams to get familiar with the process so that when you sit down to take the actual NC, you're not unfamiliar with it, and it's something that's just kind of um, ingrained into how you take this test. So here's the three-pass plan. When I say pass, what I'm talking about is a pass through the questions. As you all know, there's 200 questions on the NCE, and so what I want for you to consider is not just going into the test and sitting down and, and just plugging through and saying, okay, I'm going to just do all 200 questions one time, and I'm going to give my best each uh, time a new question pops up. That's one way to do it, but this three-pass plan, I think, is a way that you can feel confident that you've done your best with every single question. And so what it involves is three different passes. The first pass, we're going to just call it pass one. Uh, here's the process. You're going to read all 200 questions one at a time. And each, for each question, you're going to answer each question in one of the following three ways. If you read this question and you have absolutely no clue at all, you're reading it and you're like, did I even study for this? What I want you to do is only mark the question for review and move on to the next question. So what do I mean by mark the question for review? Question that you take on the NCE is gonna have something similar to this. This is a sample question from the practice test that I offer. And notice up in the corner, there's a box that says review later. We've designed our practice tests to be just like the actual NCE. And on the actual NCE, there's a, a box that you can check. It's not gonna look exactly like this, but that's for you to review that question later if you want to. And so we're gonna use that feature that the test platform has to our advantage. So what I want you to do, if you have no clue at all, I want you to mark that question for review later and then forget about it. We're going to move on to the next question. If you absolutely have no idea, don't fret it. Just mark it for review and then move on. If you think you know the answer or an answer comes to you from out of the blue, but you're not totally sure, I want you to mark the answer that you think is correct and mark the question for you. What that's going to do is add it to the list of questions that you want to review later, but because you think you know the answer, you've already marked it, so when you come back to it later, that marking is still going to be on there, and you can either confirm that you knew what it was or change it if you've got new information or if another question kind of triggered something in your memory about it. And then the third uh, way that you're going to respond on the first pass is if you're certain that you know the answer, like you have no doubt whatsoever, you studied hard on this, you're, you're certain that it's, it's what you believe it is, then you're going to only mark the answer that you believe is correct and not mark it for review. If you know you don't need to review that, you can just say, that's one question I don't ever have to look at again. 
So pass one is the only time that you'll read all 200 questions. So you can kind of see how this works. On the very first pass, every single question is going to get some sort of mark, either a review later mark only, a answer checked and the review mark, or just the answer check. And that way, uh, every single question will show up. You don't want to pass an answer without giving it some sort of mark. Okay, y'all tracking? Good. So for pass two, what I want you to do is go back and review all the questions that you've marked for review. Usually you'll be able to rule out one of the two correct, incorrect choices, or maybe two of the incorrect choices. What we want to do is narrow down what we're actually having to think through. And then you're going to choose between the two that are left. You're going to, if you select an answer on these, you're going to unmark that question for review, and then you're going to move on. If you still have no clue, don't mark it with a, an answer and leave it marked for review, and we'll follow it and pass three with the strategy there. So this is the way that you'll probably answer a significant number of questions on the exam. And don't be alarmed by that. Uh, a lot of people feel confident that they're headed in the right direction, but they may not know for certain every single question. So pass two might be the one that you have to really do the most thinking on because you're, you're talking about narrowing it down. And in a minute, we'll talk about some answering methodologies. I've got a document that Rachel is going to share with you guys. But for pass two, what we're doing is trying to narrow down the questions that we're having to answer. If we think we know it and we feel good about that, that guess, then we can select that answer and unmark it for review so we don't ever have to see it again. This is where your repetition in your study materials is really going to help you out because repetition of your study material is how you're able to easily narrow down answers that don't fit or don't make sense. We can't retain everything, but usually with your repetition, you're going to be able to say, I know that's not it because that goes with this other thing, or that goes with this other theory, or that doesn't belong here at all. And that's what we want to be able to do. And the way that we do that is we've sat with the material. It's become part of our uh, way of thinking, and we're able to just, just um, come up with, with easier answers as we go. So that's pass number two. Pass number three. We're going to answer the remaining questions using the educated or blind luck guessing technique. That's the sad reality is that there's going to be questions on here that you probably did not study. That's the way it is with the practice tests that I do. We have questions on that practice test that are not in our study manual, and that's just to prepare people for the uh, possibility that they're going to see questions that uh, they didn't prepare for. So don't be alarmed by this. There's ways of uh, taking educated guesses. Uh, and these have been researched as, as ways to improve the chances that you'll get these questions right, even though you, you don't have any idea what it's talking about. So what's an educated? We only want to use this strategy on the third pass through all of the questions. So here's a few different ways of doing educated guessing. When two out of four choices are opposites, you want to select one of these two as the correct answer. The reason for that is that when they design these questions and they are selecting multiple choice answers, they're going to give you answers that fit with the uh, opposite thinking. And so if one answer is yes, it is, and the other answer is no, it is not, it might be one of those. At least the likelihood is, is great that they're trying to use those opposites as a way of kind of tripping you up. And so uh, selecting one of those two choices, that's the opposites, uh, that's an educated guess. Non-answers, for example, if the answer is zero or none of the above, those are usually poor guesses. We want to avoid those. Whereas all of the above is generally a good guess. So if you see all of the above, and you've gotten to pass three with an all of the above, then uh, that's generally a good guess for it. The other option is blind luck guessing. And again, we're only doing this on pass three. We're not blind guessing on pass one or two. Blind luck guessing is basically just looking at the longest of the multiple choice answers and selecting that one. If two of the four choices sound almost identical, like you know, both of these answers kind of sound the same, pick the one that's longer. And again, we're only doing this on pass three if we have no clue. If both of these answers, we're not really sure, but they sound the same, go with the longer one. That's blind luck. So that's the three pass method. I wanna give an opportunity if you have questions about 
that three pass plan. I'm happy to, to answer those before I, I talk about the answering methodology. Are there any questions so far? I know I'm kind of working fast through this material, so I want to make sure that if you have a question. Yeah, Lynn. Yes, hi. I was curious, how long uh, do you spend on each pass? So that's a great question. What I would do is spend as long as it takes on each pass. Now, if you are getting so tripped up, you don't want to spend minutes on one question because if you take 200 questions and you've got under four hours for the exam, that means you've got to go through 50 questions an hour, less than or more than 50 questions an hour. So you can kind of time that out. That's, you know, that's about a minute or so per question. So if you're taking longer than that, you need to move on and mark it for review later uh, if you don't have an educated guess. This is why this plan is so good is because if you know, you know, you just check the answer, you can move on and then you can spend that time on pass two when you're having to, to guess it. So yeah, as far as like how, how long each pass should take, uh, that's really going to kind of depend on, uh, on how well you prepared probably and how quickly you can answer those questions on pass one. Great question though. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, very good. You guys are on it. I know you're gonna do great. So Rachel, I have given her a PDF document uh, that looks like this. And so Rachel, if you can share that with everyone in the chat, I'm not gonna go over this in great detail. There's just not enough time but uh, I do have a YouTube channel and I will try to, to post that in the event page where I've gone over all of these on my YouTube channel, each of these answering methodologies. So this is just a document that uh, will help you to know how to approach any question. Just a lot of different ideas on what to do instead of just approaching questions blindly. I don't know if you guys remember preparing for the GRE or the SAT, but a lot of what we do to prepare has to do with reading questions, knowing how to answer questions, how to narrow it down, and the NCE is no different. I've heard it said everywhere, this is a reading exam. You really have to read the questions to read the answers and to know exactly uh, how to formulate your responses based on what it's what it's uh, worded as. And so these answering methodologies is, is just a way to, to, to think through the questions. I have on here also the three pass plan. It's not as a deep, not as detailed explanation as you guys have gotten here, but uh, that might be something really helpful. And I see that Rachel's already posted it. And, and we'll also post it uh, on the event page and, and Rachel can put it in the group if she wants to. So, okay, uh, a few other things that I wanna point you towards, because again, having a plan is gonna be one way to lessen your testing anxiety. Just knowing that you're on the right track, that you're following a, a path that uh, feels good there's so much study material out there and it can be really overwhelming knowing what to do with it all and how to approach it. So if you need a plan, you can go to my website, prep.com and, and Rachel can post a link with, with the referral thing. And you can download this CES roadmap. It's basically a nine step plan that I created to help you work through your planning, your prepping, and then that final week before you test. Uh, there's also a page that's not shown here that that's kind of like a last minute checklist, you know, for things to get ready in that final week. And it's free. Obviously, you've just got to put your email address in and, and it'll send it to you. So Rachel can include uh, a link for that as well. Additionally, I'm really focused on planning for you guys because I, I really want for you all to pass. Next Tuesday, Rachel and I have been planning another webinar for 30 at night where I'm going to cover the recommended study plan. This is where I'll cover exactly how to approach the material, how to use practice exams, how to incorporate uh, testing workshop videos that I've got or, or other resources. And the, the great thing about this is even if you're not using products from NCE, you can incorporate this recommended study plan with any uh, study material that you're using. Uh, I am going to, however, present an opportunity for you to get access to all of this content that goes with my recommended study plan uh, for absolutely free with just a little bit of help 
uh, from you and your expertise on, on answering some questions. I'll present all of that next week at the, the webinar. I hope that you can uh, choose to attend it because that recommended study plan is the one that we use at NCE with our guaranteed study package. Basically, we, we guarantee if you follow this recommended study plan and do not pass the NCE, I'll refund all of your money. And in the 20 years that NCE business, we've only had to do that six times, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and, and some of those were because of really extenuating circumstances. Like I think somebody got in a car accident on the way to the test and they probably should have um, not taken it, but they did anyway. And we, of course, refunded their money when they didn't pass. So uh, we'll present that next week, okay? Any questions so far? I want to make sure that I'm uh, not breezing over anything too fast. This next section is a little bit longer. So uh, if you have any questions about the three-pass plan or the answering methodologies, I want to take a minute to answer those as well. We good? I have a question. Mm -hmm. This is Tanya. Hi, Tanya. I have a question on the pre-pass plan. What, I know you were saying flag the questions that we are not sure of or absolutely yes. just don't know the answer to. What would you recommend or suggest flagging? I mean, it's 200 questions. If I got 75 of the questions flagged for review, doesn't that also cut into my time? So... Yeah. So first off, if you only flag 75 questions for review, you're doing awesome. <laughs> that is a really, to, to know for certain that you've got 120 of those questions, right? That's, that's fantastic. But it's not going to cut into your time as much as you think. Those questions that you just know, that, those are going to be the quickest ones that you answer. It's the ones that you have to stop and think about that are going to take the most time. And so taking the time to review those and marking them for review, the reason that that's a, a, a good strategy is because sometimes you might get some clues to those answers from the other questions. Sometimes as you're reading these other questions and answering them, it'll jog your memory about one of those questions that you've already marked for review. And especially if you've already had kind of a hint as to what it is or you think you might know, Sometimes reading those other questions can really kind of solidify and that can become a, okay, now I'm certain for this answer that I've marked for review. That's, that's part of the reason that we do that. The other part is so that you can not forget which questions you've, you've skipped over. If you don't know the answer, marking it for review and coming back to it, using that the educated guessing or the blind luck method, that again is not going to take a whole lot of time. And so we don't want to spend time trying to figure out a question that we just simply don't know the answer to. It makes more sense to spend time with the ones that you think you know than the ones that you just plain don't know. It's really a way of maximizing the time that you're spending on each question. Does that make sense, Tanya? Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good, great question. You guys are on top of things here. All right, what else? Good. Okay, so we're going to move on to qualifying for accommodations, what you need to know and what you can expect. So I have sent an email out to current customers and past customers just to try and pull them on what types of accommodations they've gotten. I've also sent an email to NBCC, which as you may know, it's incredibly difficult to get a hold of somebody there, but I did get back and they gave me a little bit of direction. And so what I've uh, put together here, a lot of it you can access from the NBC site, but I've tried to consolidate it and we'll kind of talk through it as well as you know some of the different accommodations that can be expected. So really important thing to know right off the bat, requests for accommodations must be submitted at the time that you register for the NCE. We'll talk more about this later. If you are planning on getting an accommodation and you've already registered for the NCE, there's a process and it's gonna be unfortunate and I'm sorry, but 
it might be worth it uh, if you need the accommodations. So qualifying for accommodations, what you need to know. So accommodations are available for really, there's a third one on here, but really mainly two. Accommodations are available for those with a qualifying disability as defined by the American Disabilities Act. And accommodations are available for examinees who use English as a second language. There's also some accommodations available if you have a religious objection to, for some reason. And if, if you have that, you can also uh, request an accommodation. And there's a process we'll talk about here in just a minute as well. In order to qualify, so the accommodation request must include a completed examination accommodation request form, and that is what Rachel indicated I had linked to in the event page, and the required documentation of your disability. And so that documentation needs to explain the need for the requested accommodation. Documentation is going to vary depending on the nature of the disability that you're dealing with. So it may be from a from a doctor or a counselor or a testing center that said that, yes, you have some anxiety. Depending on who gave you that documentation, it's going to look a little bit different, okay? So if you are looking for an accommodation for a disability, here are the requirements. You need an individual assessment by a qualified professional or if you've already had an accommodation on another test, you can, you can present the, the appropriate written confirmation of that previous examination based on the same disability or diagnosis. If you've got a different disability or diagnosis, you can't use that previous accommodation for obvious reasons to get an accommodation on this exam. It has to be the same one. So documentation from a qualified professional must include your full name, the specific diagnosed disability or impairment, the substantial limitations, the specific examination accommodations that are requested, and why that recommendation, recommended accommodation is needed. And then the person that's, the professional needs to include all of their credentials, and it must be signed by them as well, okay? There's a lot of information that they need, but they're really trying to make sure that the request that you're making is actually needed and, and substantiated by that uh, professional. If you're looking for a previous accommodation to paperwork to, to suffice, it can qualify from other types of high stakes or standardized tests, CRE or the SAT. Uh, it must include the official documentation from the academic institution or testing administration organization, and it has to include explanation of the accommodation that was provided and the reason that such accommodation was provided as determined by a qualified professional. So kind of the same thing, you're just not having to present the actual documentation from the professional since it was uh, submitted to another organization. Okay, so here are several different ways that your exam may be accommodated. Uh, List on the documentation form that you submit uh, for your application. It says that you could get additional time. I just spoke earlier today with an individual who is getting six hours instead of three hours and 45 minutes. I've talked with another person who got double the time, so you know, over, over seven hours. You can use you can be accommodated with a human reader. If this is somebody that would actually read through all the questions for you. Now, if you're, if you're doing this, what I would recommend is that you take some practice exams with a, a person reading them to you. You want to simulate uh, in your practice exams what it's actually going to be like, because that's going to change the, the timing of things, and you want to try to do things exactly in your preparation the way that they're going to be. That, he, that reader is going to be there for you. They are your person. And so if you want them to read slower, if you want them to repeat a sentence, if you want them to repeat uh, a word, they can do that. But just know that that's going to take up some of your time. So with a, with a reader, you just want to make sure that you're practicing get somebody trusted that's patient <laughs> that can walk through it all with you 
and just really know how to engage that person to help you, you know, in a way that's actually going to be beneficial. A scribe, um, there are paper and pencil accommodations that are available. And so you can have somebody write that down for you or somebody that can operate the computer for you if that's what you need. You can also be accommodated by a separate testing environment. Uh, they have isolated rooms where you're not going to be with other mm. tests. There, you, when you go to take the test, you are in a room with multiple test takers who are taking any number of different tests. When I was there, there were people taking lots of different types of tests. And so if that's something that is going to trouble your disability or, or bother you in some way, they can offer a separate testing environment. Other examining that uh, took it that had accommodations said that they were allowed to take in a back cushion. That's what they needed for an accommodation because they're sitting for a long time. Uh, and there may be some other things as well. Um, the Josh, other thing that I, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. There, I know you probably can't see the screen or whatnot, but I have a member. She wanted to know if you had like a sample letter of accommodations. A sample letter of accommodation, like like from a professional, like a professional, is that what you're looking for, Loria? Could, could you verify that for us or clarify that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so can you hear me? It's a little right. Okay. Yeah, a sample letter, like I have my physician, I have test anxiety, so he wanted to know exactly what needs to be written in the letter, what needs to be so. Yeah, so I'll go back to that slide here. The, th these are the things that need to be included from that professional. It's got to have your name, the specific diagnosed ability. So if you are dealing with anxiety, you're going to have a di an anxiety diagnosis, like generalized anxiety disorder. The substantial limitations. So that would be, they would need to include like how this affects you. Like when you're sitting down to take tests and, and the way that it shows up for you, like your symptoms, the accommodations that are requested. So what is it that you need in order to be able to take this in light of those, those symptoms that show up, why that recommended accommodation is needed. So I, I, I need more time because I get panicked and I have to read slower when I get panicked. And so I need more time to get through so the, the professional, your doctor or your psychologist would need to just explain, you know, why your anxiety is impairing your ability to do the test the way that it's uh, designed and why you need an accommodation. So, they just need to do that. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question. Does the NBCC, does the website have like a form or anything that's laid out that we can, you know, that they'll be able to see in regards to what so, that will look like for the doctor yeah so nbcc doesn't have a form that the qualified professional fills out they do have a form that you have to submit with that documentation from the qualified professional so most people that would be writing letters like this have have done this sort of thing before i've i've written dozens of them for people that, who are who are looking for things for for any number of reasons so it's just a pretty simple letter you'll probably have to sign well now you, i was thinking you might have to sign a release of information or something like that but uh, and yes elizabeth i just saw your your question it can be an lcsw if, if that's who you're working with really any any licensed professional who's capable of of giving you a diagnosis good questions yeah this slide, all these slides, um, I'm going to send to Rachel and she can post them with the, the video link as well. So you can have all this information. This is also on the NBC website. When you go to the accommodations, this is from a document. There's just a lot of information in that document. So yeah. this might be a little bit simpler. Thank Good you. Good questions. Thank you. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about kind of what to expect with the actual ways that you might be accommodated? No? I have a question. Uh, this uh -huh. is Tanya again. I guess I guess what I'm I'm wanting to know is is that 
I don't normally suffer with anxiety, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And I don't know, are they, are, are they going to be looking for a diagnosis that's chronic? You know, a person who normally suffers with anxiety or is it, cause I didn't realize I had testing anxieties. I mean, yeah. I, I've been through, I've gotten my, my associates, I've gotten my bachelor's, you know, my master's, and I didn't realize I had testing anxiety. This is going to be my fourth time taking this exam. Okay. And, and I, it, it wasn't until this on the last time, this third time that I realized, okay, uh, something's going on with me because I mean, I, I, I've studied, I've done, I've done everything. I've done, been to the, to the seminars. I've been, I mean, mm -hmm. as far as knowing the material, I felt like I knew the material is for me. I ran out of time. I'm looking at the, 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 the clock. The environment, the you are, we're in there, we're in cubicles. People are coming in and out, checking in and out. It was very distracting to me. Right. And I didn't realize that the previous times, it wasn't until it was this third time. And it's like, I had 30 minutes left with like maybe 75, 80 questions. Yeah. And so yeah. I just went through and clicked any, many, miny mo. Right. And right. so I, I mean, is it something that uh, something that's chronic so that we have to have it? I don't think that it has to be chronic. I think that if you go and talk with a counselor or you um, just spend some time working with somebody who can understand your symptoms and explain what you're needing, even if it's just situational, they are going to have to, to give you a diagnosis of some type of, of anxiety or, you know, they, they would be the ones that would have to determine that. I don't want to tell you what it is that you have. But the, it does not have to be something that you're just dealing with lifelong. It could be situational. It just has to be documented. And to be honest, I don't think that anybody at NBCC is going to look at the documentation that they give you and say, no, you don't have that. That would be pretty horrible if they did. And you, there is an appeal process if you if you do if you do apply for an accommodation and they don't give it to you. I just saw that that Keisha posted the document in the chat that has all of that information, and so you can look that up if for some reason you apply for an accommodation and then they choose not to give it to you. You can appeal that process, but again, all that has to be done when you register for the NCE. So. Okay, and one more question. Can um, can I get my letter from, because I know you said you can get it from an LCSW. Can you get it from an LCDC? I don't see why not. As if you're, I mean, if you're being treated by an LCDC, that, you know, a licensed codependency counselor, if, that, if that's what you mean, different states have different abbreviations. Yes, a license. Well, I'm an LCDC. <laughs> so okay. so but, I don't think you could write the letter for yourself. No, no, I know I can't write it for myself. I'm yeah. just saying that can another LCDC write it? I, I think that that would probably be okay. You can actually send an email and, and ask that, but I, I don't see why it wouldn't as long as they are capable of diagnosing and accurately assess for, for what type of accommodation you're looking for. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Okay. All right. We're going to move on. I, I'll have time for more questions at, at the end. I, I'm not in a hurry to, to get off anywhere. So other types of accommodations, like I mentioned, English as a second language. Again, documentation is required indicating participation in an ESL or ELL program within 10 years of the accommodation request. So if you've been a part of any of those programs within the last 10 years, uh, you just have to supply that documentation. And again, the accommodations might include extended time or use of a word-to-word -word bilingual dictionary. Those dictionaries can't interpret phrases or sentences. It has to be just word for word. And like I also said, you can get a religious belief accommodation to, to get this. You need a notarized statement 
uh, the statement of the conflict that you have with the NBCC policy or procedure, as well as a written statement from an individual who knows your situation and your religious belief or practice. And so submission of the application for, for accommodations must be submitted when you register for the exam. If you decide you need an accommodation and did not submit your application, they'll have to cancel your previous or existing registration and you'll have to re-register. If you're taking it for certification, if you're taking the NCE for certification, then you submit your documentation to this email address, which is in that document that Keisha shared in the, in the chat. If you're taking it for state licensure, then there's another email, which is totally confusing, and I wish that they would streamline all of this, but <laughs> this is the way that things are right now. So, okay. Any other questions? I have a question. This is Keisha. So if, hi, so if you, I guess I was trying to figure out what makes sense. You've already scheduled for the exam and then you submit for accommodations. And I've heard that they can put you out like eight weeks. Okay. I'm not sure how true that is. And does it even make sense at, at that point if you've already scheduled and had your date coming up? And I guess the second yeah. part of that is, is okay go ahead and answer that one okay so that's a difficult question to answer because it's kind of kind of personal right it, it has to deal with your own confidence in your ability to take the test with accommodation knowing that you can somehow manage or address your own anxiety or i'm assuming if that's why you needed the accommodation so you know if you feel like you're you're finding ways of addressing that on your own and don't want to go through the hassle um, of rescheduling it. And I, don't, I, I tried to find where it said if you could get that money refunded from the, from the first one or not. I, I was having difficulty finding that information, but, but that's kind of another factor. You really have to determine whether or not you feel like it's worth that effort. It might be, especially if you're realizing you have you know, a substantial need for it. Um, it may be that if you spend some time with a counselor of your own or, you know, look for some mindfulness strategies or, or some other ways of, of addressing your anxiety that, that you could surprise yourself and do really, really well without the need for that. I would recommend taking a full length practice exam just to get the feel for what it's like. I know that's, that's a big time investment, but sitting and taking 200 questions, you know, that sometimes you don't know what, what to expect with that. And that can be kind of disorienting for people as well. So, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, the other part of that question I say is you have to cancel your previous registration. Do I like, so I've submitted already for the accommodations after I schedule but I haven't canceled yet. So I need to cancel it or wait until the accommodation is approved before I cancel. That is a good question. I think that if, I don't know how long you, how long it's been since you registered, that, that might be a question, if, you know, to send an email to one of these email addresses here on the screen, just to, just to verify that. I hate for you to cancel something out of turn. All that it said is that you need to submit the documentation with your registration or at the same time as your registration. So that would be a question for them, I think. Thank you. And then, Loria, you asked, should we get the accommodations first, then schedule for the test? I would make sure before you schedule for the test that you have all of the documentation that you need to submit with it, like from your, from your professional provider, what they're going to do when they grant your, your registration, basically when you apply, they're going to send you an email that says, yes, you are good to go to schedule your exam. And that email that you receive saying that you're good to go to schedule, it's going to have the accommodation that they've granted you listed in that email. So that's why you have to submit your application for accommodations with the 
enrollment or the registration because when they send you that email saying, yes, you can go ahead and schedule, it tells you what your accommodation is. Does that make sense? Okay. You guys are asking some really great questions. Anything else? So I can stick around for a few more minutes. I just want to remind you all next Tuesday night, we're doing another webinar, 6.30 p.m. Central Time. We're covering a recommended study plan. This is actually the, the plan that I used when I prepared for the NCE. I had taken an eight-year break from grad school before taking it. Here in Texas, you have to take the NCE before you can accumulate your hours. And so I was completely, I don't know, thing that I learned in school, but I followed this recommended study plan and passed on my first try. It was that effective. So I hope that you'll come back and join us uh, next Tuesday night at 6.30. Happy to stick around for if, if there's any other questions. And I'll be in the, you can shoot me a message in the, the Facebook a group or the event page as well if you have any other additional questions and i'm sure rachel will post all the the documents and everything there as well so thank you all so much okay. let me know if you have any other questions otherwise we'll have, see you next i have a question huh so with your study guide that that's a charge for the study guide so the recommended study is plan is it's a it's free i'm gonna i'm gonna give it to the group um that comes to the webinar for free it comes with the, the products that i sell but I'll make sure that Rachel has it so that she can post it in the group for anybody that wants it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. And then how would someone use that if let's just say, for instance, I'm like a month out? Yeah. Where so, do you pick up? Right. And so the way that you would use it is you would spend more time working through it. You know, we encourage people to to spend like 90 days. That's our kind of like give yourself 90 days. But if you if you have to do it in 30 days, then you're doing three days of work in one day. <laughs> and that's just gotcha. uh, but you're not you're not that far behind because you've already started studying for it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But there is okay. a there is a day tracker on one of the pages that kind of shows you what to do each day if you're following the plan. So and it's okay, divided awesome. up by 30, 60, and 90 days as well.